Welcome to the Rap Race to Five podcast, where we discuss money, mindset, real estate investing, and ways to achieve financial independence. Whether you are a rookie or a veteran needing new ideas for investing or creating side hustles, you're in the right place. Here to challenge you to think out of the box, your hosts, Felipe Mejia and Diego Corzo. Diego, what's up, dude? Dude, we have Ian today. Dude was talking about he has over or had over $200,000 in debt and how he's paying it off. Man, that's amazing. It's a great story for anyone listening. You got to watch. You got to listen to the end. I actually give him a whole month for free uh, and you got to stick around to see what it was for. Oh, man. Yeah, I really like the way that like just the accountability that he had towards paying his debt and having that communication because you asked him about his communication with with his wife. And I feel like that would that's really important uh, so that you understand that you and your family are a team. Yeah, hundred percent. And then sometimes I do feel bad, like when I ask kind of a little bit deeper questions, but at the same time, I think that's what keeps the podcast real and honest, right? It's like, okay, that's cool. You paid off 60 grand, but dude, how did your family feel about you? Like cutting back hundred grand off of debt? Like, like, I know you had to sacrifice a lot. So I love the answer that he gave. It's super awesome. Uh, but before we get started and we bring Ian in, just so that you guys know the rat race to five real estate course is on the website at rat race to five.com. Uh, it is 50% off until the end of the year. Use rat rate or what, what is the code, Diego? RR half off. RR half off. You heard it here, guys. All right, let's get started with Ian. Ian, welcome to the Rat Race to Five podcast, bro. I'm super excited that you're here. Diego, what's up, dude? Where are you at right now, Diego? What's up? What's up? I am in Jacksonville right now. If you can see my camera, I am hanging out with my yeah. brother for Thanksgiving. Love it. And uh, yeah. That's traveling. awesome. That's awesome. And you are I'm actually, you're, you're not in Austin. I mean, in Nashville, in right? Nashville. No, I'm in the Smokies. I'm in one of my short-term rentals. Um, you know, so we're, we're just kind of getting it ready for, for Christmas, but we're not here for me or Diego. Ian, how are you, my guy? What's hey up, guys. dude? How are you? Are you, are you in a, a log cabin over there? Yeah, man. That looks if great. You see around, <laughs> yeah, I'm in a log cabin. I got the, got the fireplace going. Super, super comfortable. Uh, awesome. But Ian, Tell us yeah. a little bit about you, man. Uh, you know, it, your your profile on Instagram says you paid off buku money in debt. Uh, but before we get to that, I know everyone's anxious to get to that, but I'm I'm interested a little bit about who you are, what you who were you in high school and in college, oh, uh, and how God. you got into all that debt, man. Let's get into it a little. Um, okay, we'll, we'll go way back. So first of all, thank you guys for having on me having me on the show. Um, I, I follow both of you online, and you know I, I respect both of you a lot. Um, thank you. So who am I? Um, born and raised New Yorker, now living in South Florida. Wow, that was a, that was a that was a COVID a COVID move, COVID inspired move. Never thought yeah. I'd be down here, but it, it was it was a good call. I've got uh, I've got two kids, four and eighteen months, and I'm oh, married. Nice. And um, yeah, like I said, born and raised in New York. And when I was in high school, I just got passionate about real estate. A lot of my friends families were in real estate. And I just thought it was kind of like a cool thing to own buildings and uh, especially in New York City, where the buildings are just, you know, next level. It's, it's the yeah. pros, right? And so I uh, went to college in Pennsylvania. I did an internship for a few summers for a big privately owned real estate company in New York City. And I was in their commercial leasing office. And I remember it was like a foreign language to me. Like, what are, what are they talking about? I don't under, understand anything. And so I remember taking uh, notes in, in these meetings and I would go write everything down. I would go to Google and I would just start like looking this stuff up. And I got passionate about real estate. And so um, graduated college, took a year off, went to law school, upstate New York uh, at Albany Law School. And um, I you know, finished law school in 2011. And came out, took the bar, and had a ton of debt. So I, when I graduated law school, it was around 190. And for anybody listening that has wow. student debt, yeah, a lot, a lot of money. So if you don't, they make it very easy for you to borrow money to go to law school. And uh, not only that, most people that are in law school don't have a lot of money, don't have a lot of cash. And so what they do is they actually, um, they kind of, uh, give you a lot of money at the beginning of the semester. Most of it goes to pay your tuition, but then there's like a, a balance that's left and that's money that's used 
for your expenses. So pretty much everything, like your rent, it's all like finance through your student loans. You study for the bar exam and then they're just like, okay, good luck in the real world. Fortunately, I had a job right out of law school in 2011. That was, you know, pretty precarious time for most people. Uh, I did a clerkship and then I was looking for my next job. And I actually went back to a law firm that I had interned at before law school. And I said, I'd love to work with you guys. They were focused on real estate. And they actually happened to be the lawyers for the people that I interned for back in college. Oh. So I'm back in the city now. I'm, I'm, I'm learning the ins and outs of being a real estate lawyer. I'm doing leasing, I'm doing finance work for big commercial properties in New York City. And at the same time, I am trying to figure out how to pay back my student debt. One thing I did in 2012 was I figured it'd be a good idea to hit pause on my loans and kind of try to regroup. I moved, I, I, like I said, I moved home um, and I did what was called a forbearance. That was not a good move for me because what happens is your loan payments pause, but the interest keeps accruing and it actually winds up getting recapitalized into your principal balance. So my balance went from like 190 to 210. So using round numbers, wow. but, it, but it ballooned substantially. And so now, you know, I wasn't making like for New York city where I was living, I wasn't making uh, a huge salary. This was 2014 and um, the market really started to pick up and I got recruited by a big global law firm to go work for them. And my salary basically doubled overnight. So I was making a lot more money. Now I was able to afford to move out on my own in the city. Um, and I was able to actually refinance my loans several different times. When I first refinanced my loans, there were like, like far, like few student loans, few banks that would actually refinance my student loans. So I took the rate down from like seven or eight percent to six or so percent. Um, and then I just kept getting it lower and lower. I eventually got it to around 2.3. Seven five percent, something around there, and that enabled me to make bigger payments, to get on a payment plan, and just get it on the right path. I've been paying this off for ten years, so this is not a story in how I made you know a million bucks in a year and was able to pay it off. This is a story in putting just a good plan in place and sticking to that plan over a long period of time. Interesting. So. so Look, look, there's so much to unpack that I don't even know where to start. I guess I want to start at the beginning then. So sure. what made you want to go to school uh, for, to, for, to be a lawyer? Um, and then what, like, what was the allure or what was the reason for like getting that much into debt? Was it just because of school? Uh, it just blows my mind sometimes that, that people can just take on that kind of debt so easily. Like, I don't know, growing up with nothing in my pockets, um, like, man, even credit cards are hard for me to take just because I was like, I already don't have anything. I'm not, I, I'm scared to borrow if I already don't have, you know? So give us a little bit of the background of why, why you chose that career path. So I graduated college in 2007 and I, I got good grades. I was president of my fraternity. I was involved in a ton of different activities and things. And I think the real world kind of hit me hit me a little bit hard. I was out there trying to look for some jobs, but nothing was really falling into place for me. So I said, you know what? Uh, I think going to law school could be a good value add to my resume. And so I decided to apply to go to law school. I didn't quite think it through. And if I was giving anybody advice on whether they want to go to law school, I would say you really have to weigh the cost and, um, and your potential for job prospects because just going to law school to go to law school is not the best idea. So I, I admit that I probably didn't go into it with the best intentions. And a lot of people go to law school saying, I'm just going to go because it's like kind of a logical uh, step after yeah. college, but it's, it's not that logical. I'm not practicing law right now anymore. So I think it added a lot of value to my resume and it gave me a skill set that allowed me, and I'm happy to talk about what I'm doing now. Uh, it definitely gave me a skill set that made me more valuable to the company that I work for. But at the same time, I didn't, I didn't really run that, that math. 
Mm, so that ma- that makes sense. You know, I have a theory that you know a lot of people. Well, I know this is true that like a lot of people that went to college for what they went to school with aren't doing that now. If you look back five, ten years later, um, but one of the things that I'm realizing is that like most college degrees you still got to have some type of entrepreneurial background to be really, really, I think in my opinion, really successful. And I remember this from, I don't remember if it was a book or what it was, but it basically it was like, it, it's not the best author that wins. It's the best selling author, right? Totally. Like, it doesn't matter how good you write. It doesn't matter if you suck at writing or you're a great writer. It doesn't matter if you're, I guess it would matter if you're a good lawyer or a bad lawyer, but at the end of the day, marketing and, and sales and business behind it is what's like really going to give it that push. hundred percent true. I, I, what really got me into sales was I was, I was listening to, I think it was a podcast, my first million with Mark Cuban. And he was talking about how if he lost it all right now, um, he would find a job in sales. Cause he said, he said, I don't know if I would ever become a billionaire again to become a billionaire. You have to have a lot of luck, but he's like, I, a 100% can become a millionaire again because I can sell. Yeah. 100% true. And I think a lot of people, um, I'm not sure how old you guys are. I'm 36. So uh, I'm in that millennial category. I think a lot of millennials are in this position where they're kind of pivoting their careers or they want to pivot their careers because they went yeah. that path like that I went. They became a lawyer or they went the corporate route. And now they're just like, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm hitting these fixed bumps in salary. I'm not where I want to be. And you're right. It's, it's all about sales when it comes down to it. If you want to excel, like really grow your revenue, you have to learn how to sell. And so is that what, is that what you're doing now? Are you in sales or what was, what's been your, your transition from law to what you're doing now? So I work for a technology company called ProDeal. And we built a platform. Uh, it's it's basically a closing table for a uh, closing table in the sky for real estate transactions. Um, I'll explain it a little bit more, but let me let me go into how I got there. It was uh, I think it was the um, winter, like new, around this time of 2017. Uh, I just had my son, and I decided I was going to start to look elsewhere. Um, to, to, to either pivot my career, maybe take uh, my legal talents and go in-house somewhere. And so I started looking and I got lunch with a buddy of mine who works for a title company and they do um, commercial title sales. So they work on, on big transactions and his boss came to lunch with us and he starts talking about how he built this platform. And he originally built it because he wanted to make it easier for uh, parties that were closing deals Uh, make it easier uh, to send them title docs on large commercial transactions. Title documents have a ton of exceptions and they get reviewed and negotiated and there's a lot involved in it. And they also need a lot of information like organizational documents from borrowers. So he thought this would be a better way to send all those title docs, but that's just one component of a transaction. There's all of the loan documents that are involved Um, there's a ton of due diligence and the platform kind of evolved into, uh, what looks just like a basic closing checklist, but married with the concept of data storage. So it's literally a requirements list, a closing checklist, uh, in a, in what we call a deal room where you can upload documents and communicate and chat and set due dates and assign tasks. And I saw this as a lawyer closing billion dollar deals. I just closed actually $2 billion multi-property portfolio deals. And I just said, this would have been amazing to have. Because I was up at two in the morning trying to send documents to our co-counsel, JV partner. We had, um, tr- you know, I remember sending email one of five, two of five, like, you know, at, at midnight because you can't send all these documents in one email. So this would have been perfect for me. And I saw it and I said, Uh, I'm, I'm sold on this. I asked them if they'd hire me. We went back and forth and they brought me on and it it's, we're still a small company. We're still under 15 employees. And when you're at a company that small, you kind of do a little bit of everything. So I, my, my job, my, my, uh, title is head of customer success. So I am basically responsible for onboarding all of our new users and conveying value, which for me is easy because 
I was the target persona, but I'm also very involved in sales too, which uh, I think is, is uh, an incredible skill set to have. And for me, it's fun. I love, I love selling. I love that. What was your transition then? Well, like in being able to pay, right? All of your debts uh, as you're transitioning from law into your new, in, into the new job, at what point in your life did you decide, okay, I'm just going to go, I'm going to go and pay as much as possible because how much have you paid down so far? So when I graduated law school, my loan balance, it, it ballooned to about 210 and I had 20,000 in credit card debt too. I had a wow. lot of credit card debt that I paid off. Okay. And I got, I got a little, I got a little like funky with the credit card debt too. Um, because the interest rates were so high. I remember I did a couple of these balance transfers with Discover Card where they charge you a, 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 like a 3% fee. But I remember saying, okay, how could I make that 3% fee worthwhile? And I compared it to the interest on the card. And I said, okay, if I pay this much per month, I'll overcome that cost and wind up saving some money. So um, I wound up getting those credit cards paid out uh, or paid off early on because I knew that was just... I call that uh, quicksand. It's it's hard to get out of. And then um, when I refied my my big loan, um, I got on a payment plan, and so it was a fixed cost for me. So I so I had that in my budget, and I said eventually when I went from the law firm to the startup, I had um, I was taking a, a pretty substantial cut in salary. And I looked at what I was going to take in and I said, can I still afford to pay my rent and still afford to pay my loans and put food on the table? And the answer was yes. And so I figured I would take a step back to take several steps forward. And will that bet pay off? I still don't, I still don't know. I think it will. I'm, I'm confident that it will, but uh, I'm still not making as much as I was back in 2018 when I made the move. And, uh, you know, I'm banking on my company being worth a lot more than it is because I have options and some stock. Yeah. Interesting. And how, and how much ha have you paid off so far? Oh, oh, um, I have just under $60,000 left. So I still have debt to go. Man. It's no, like but another that's awesome, No, that's I was going to awesome. say, that's, yeah, that's, that's incredible how much you've already paid off. Uh, Ian, yeah. I, I have a question for those people that are that are listening with credit card debt or student loan debt. And they're like, man, I'm never going to get out of this. Or, you know, I, I, it's it, and and we can we can even take it a little step further. Uh, people that feel like they're going to lose their families, maybe even their lives. Like, what do you say to someone like that? That because you're crawling your way out of it, and you're still, you know, you could say you're still you're still halfway there, or you're getting to that position. So, yeah. what do you say to somebody? First of all, who's on I like step I one. No, I acknowledge the um, I acknowledge the emotions that are present when you have that much debt because I felt all of them: anger, yeah. um, fear, uh, disappointment, and myself. How did I get into this? Did I make the wrong decision? So I acknowledge all those, and it's important for anybody who has that to acknowledge the emotions that are there. And look, the only way to do it in a uh, in a legal and safe way is to literally figure out what you owe. You have to organize it and put it, put it all into some sort of order. And then you have to, you have to budget. You have to know how much money you have coming in and how much money you have going out. Now, if we want to take it to the most extreme example where someone literally doesn't have enough money coming in to afford to pay off their loans, <clears throat> you have to look at, um, you have to look at, hopefully these are um, student loans. But the government has programs to support that, maybe income-based repayment. So you have to look at that. If it's credit card debt, you have to look at some sort of uh, debt consolidation. They ha have people out there that do this, but <clears throat> you have to figure out a way to stop the bleeding and you got, got to cut up the credit card. And then you need to do what you need to do to bring in more money. I always said, if I lost my job, I would literally just start driving an Uber. I, Felipe, I saw you posted all the things that you were doing to hustle. Yeah. yeah. But I think that's the difference between some people is, are you willing to hustle? You know, like when I was in 2012, I remember like 
being on Twitter to get all the Nike sneaker drops to then just sell them just to try to bring in some extra money. Yeah. Um, I put together a, uh, and if you are trying to organize your debt, I have a debt payoff tracker that I created literally to answer that question because people often wonder, how do I prioritize my debt? Do I uh, use a snowball method or avalanche method or whatever? And so I literally built a, a tracker that actually you can put in all your information and then like choose what method you want and it'll organize it for you. So it's, an, it's another tool I think that could help people. I always, I always, I always tell people to just sell feet pics on OnlyFans to pay off. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best oh way to pay off. I know no, we had that conversation for Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no one wants to see my feet. <laughs> you never I'm know. Sure, you never, you never know. know. I'm sure someone yeah. out there would pay five ninety nine okay. or whatever. Yeah. DM, but it's DM really, me. <laughs> it's interesting because a lot of people feel like, like they, well, I always tell people that they need to learn that there is a sacrifice that they need to take in the short term, whether, yeah. and that is creating a side hustle. And this goes for anybody that wants to create extra income to invest or extra income to get out of the bad debt, right? Um, and it is a sacrifice, but if you give yourself a timeline, just know like, hey, I'm going to do it for just one year. That's it. So that because if not, you get overwhelmed when you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm never going to pay this off or I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. And the answer is that's not true. <clears throat> you need to set yourself, put yourself a deadline, a timeline and what you're going to be able to to do and respect the process and respect that that money that's coming in. It's solely to pay those those loans. If not, you people are going to get too, too overwhelmed. You got to get it. disciplined with it. I, what, so in 20, uh, the end of 2020, uh, right when I moved down to, uh, to Florida, I was at my heaviest weight ever. I, I clocked in it at, I'm normally like in the one eighties, I clocked in at 207 and I like nothing, none of my clothes fit. I felt awful. And I started working with this amazing nutritionist. I also have digestive issues. So like I, I, I need a nutritionist for other reasons, but I started working with somebody new who um, started to tweak little things. It was wake up in the morning and do like visualization work, meditation. And it was like little tiny things here and there. And the, the more that you add in good things, um, the, the, the easier it is to stick with it. So for example, I didn't restrict my food. I was adding in more vegetables. I was doing, I was acting more in the, in the positive than I was in the negative. And that's like what you say, if you're able to like add in a side hustle or add in something that inspires you, um, or that, um, you can have fun with, it's a much easier path than trying to go to your budget and say, I'm going to cut out my, uh, my gym expense and Netflix and all these things that are giving you pleasure. So you do have to make hard choices, but I would say, try to be additive rather than, uh, subtractive. If that's even a word. And now, by the way, now I, I lost over 20 pounds doing that. Good for you. You know, I tell people all the time, um, it, basically what you just said, apply it to real estate. Like people are like, Oh, well, I can't afford the down payment. Well then add a, a side hustle, add at something so that you can like no one's gonna give it to you it's something you have to hustle and grind for and like you said you got to put yourself on a plan you said a payment plan or some sort i just think with real estate it's the same thing put yourself on a payment plan but put it into an account savings or something so that yeah. you can purchase that real estate right and and if you're not putting yourself in a plan to do that it's never going to happen the best time to do it was like yesterday the second best time is today you put yourself on a game plan you put yourself a goal to put, have that down payment for that real estate uh, property or, or to pay off debt, right. Or to lose a little bit of weight or whatever it is that you're looking to do. You get the, the biggest thing is you got to plan. What is that saying, Diego? If you, if you, like, if you, do, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail or something. Yeah. You have, you have to start planning. It's not just going to happen on its own. Totally. Now, Ian, question for you on the, um, what, so you owe around 60,000 left. Right. Yeah. What is um, do you know by when you will be done paying that off? My so I refinance I, when I refinanced, I think it was a 15 year term. Mm -hmm. um, so and I refinanced in 20. 
2012. I think I should be done. So let's just say it was 2012. So 2027 Mm -hmm. should be done by, which uh, I guess it's like six years. So, you know, I'm not even, I don't even, I don't even worry about it for me. I Uh just like, it literally comes out. And once you're going to say, once it's done, what are you going to do? Yeah. Like how, how are you going to allocate that money? Real estate. Like I, I'm literally, I, I'm siphoning off money now from my paycheck into savings for a real estate fund. And then it'll be literally for the same thing. Mm-hmm. Ian, what is your, what does your wife think about the debt? Uh, you know, you said you gained weight and then you lost weight. Like how does your wife fit into all this picture and family? Cause you said you have a young one and all that. Uh, you know, how do you budget too? How do you budget for that? Uh, you know, I like to keep it real on the podcast for like, real life people experiences, right? Like, dude, I yeah. have a kid. I get it. A four-year-old. Like, it's great to say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to try to lose weight or I'm trying to pay off this debt, but I'm also not taking food out of my kids' mouths to do that. You know, I'm not, I'm also not like telling my wife, Hey, you got to walk to work so that we can save money. It's like, how does that work yeah. with a family dynamic? Like give us some real life experience on that. Well, um, real life experience was in 2017, right before my son was born, my wife actually lost her job we were deciding whether she was, was, whether it was worthwhile for her to go, uh, to go back to work after maternity leave or to stay at home because, you know, she wasn't making a lot of money. And in New York city, what she was bringing home would have basically been the cost for childcare had she gone to work. So we kind of were leaning towards pretty much, you know, her not going back to work and she lost her job and the decision was made for us. So, um, that definitely put some added pressure, but again, the numbers worked out for us where we were able to afford, um, the basics in the city and, you know, go out occasionally go to the occasional show, but not live this lavish life. She, um, comes from a family that values savings and instilled good money habits in her. And, Mm um, you know, I'm not, not saying my family didn't instill good habits, but I think my money habits could have been a little bit little better. Better, yeah. Yeah, and and so uh, I, she, for example, taught me what a Roth IRA was, and I never knew about it. I just had a brokerage account where I was screwing around, and <laughs> and my father-in-law, he preaches the idea of this ripple effect. The decisions yeah. you make today are going to ripple into your future, and that has really made an impression on me. Got um, it. In terms of, of uh, the budgeting and the money and stuff, um, it's stressful sometimes. Like I'm not superhuman. And just because you have a budget and, um, you know, I talk about this stuff doesn't mean I have it 100% figured out. I was just talking to, I was talking to my, my 90-year-old grandmother uh, a few weeks ago, and I said to her, we were reflecting. It was a Jewish holiday. We were reflecting on, on the meaning of the holiday, and I said, you know, um, so grandma, you are, you know, you're in your nineties. What, what life advice do you have? And she literally said, if anybody tells you they have it figured out, they're lying to you because they don't. And I just thought that was like really profound. And, uh, so just back to my point, you know, for as much as I, uh, I, I spend on, on my time with finances, there's, I still get stressed about it. You know, and, and, and so I'm like everybody else just trying to make it work. And I think you got to communicate with your spouse, got to be on the same page. We combined all of our finances right when we got married. So we sit down at the beginning of every month and we go through everything and we just bought a house, which we've been saving up for, for a long time. So, um, we had a lot of expenses this month. And so we want something, I forget what it was. She was saying she wanted something. And I just said, can we just wait until next month? Because we are like, you know, kind of tapped out this month. It's just the kind of communication you need to have. Yeah, that okay open communication is, is absolutely key, man. In any healthy relationship, business partnership, uh, in all that, it's like, hey, let's look at the finances or let's look at revenue. Let's look at P&Ls. You know, it's right. important to look at what, whatever, what business is doing and your, and, and, and your, your relationship is a business. Your business is a relationship, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand and having that open level of communication as to what is going on is super healthy. So that everyone's on the same page, you know, a business will fail when you're not on the same page, your marriage can really hurt 
if it, it's, it doesn't hurt because you're in debt. It doesn't hurt because things are happening. It hurts because you don't communicate about those things. Now, I'm not a marriage expert, but I know that in real Same. estate, for example, me and Diego, we have a very open communication. Hey, did money come in? Did money not come in? Did we make sales? Do we need to, you know, what do we need to do this client? Or, you know, there's a lot of communication. Uh, and that's been key to the success of our podcast or rat race or, you know, anything that we do together. Um, so yeah, I, I kudos to you for having that open communication. I think if more people had that, there would be more successful business relationships, more successful transactions as well as marriages, you know, just open communication. Yeah. Yep. And, and Ian too, what, what I really like something that you mentioned earlier is that you have that conversation at the beginning of, of every month. And I feel like for some people that may, may feel maybe in the beginning, a little bit uncomfortable of talking about money or bringing those things up is more like, look, we have it on the schedule that every, like the first Monday of every month for two hours, we talk about the, the financing, the budgets, anything that we want to do for that particular month, or maybe that yeah. quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, and it creates that level of like, Hey, it's on schedule right now is the best time to talk about. It. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. hundred percent. So moving on, Ian, you said you wanted to get into real estate. Uh, I, so you have $60,000 in debt. I'm assuming you want to finish that debt and then get started in real estate. Out of curiosity, what's holding you back from buying rentals now? Uh, good question. So first of all, I wanted to close on my house right now. So like that was the first thing I wanted to just get that out of the way. And then I just... I. I was, I closed in the beginning of September. So I said, okay, I'm going to start to look. And then my goal is big is 2022 to buy my first rental property. Okay. Um, so I, the only thing I think that's holding me back right now is just, um, finding deals that make financial sense. I have a mm. solid underwriting calculator, um, that I just, I'll go on Zillow or I'll go on Redfin and I'll just look at deals and I'll see what's out there. And I'm like, okay, do these numbers make sense? No, keep looking. And I'm just right now, I'm also trying to build out my network in South Florida because I don't know a lot of people here. And I don't think I'm going to find the best possible deal on market. I think I need to find something off market to make the numbers work. And so whether it's, you know, finding some property managers and playing golf or some brokers in town or, or whatever. I just need to start getting out there. Um, and I've been a little cautious with COVID and, you know, uh, like I said, closing on this house, but now I feel like I'm geared up to do it. And for me, the debt is not so much in the way I have it factored into my budget and I already have some cash stocked away. I'd like to build up that pile a little bit more, but I think that, you know, for the first deal, maybe I can find a partner um, and just just get it under my belt. Yeah, That's it cool. sounds like uh, I would hate for you to fall into analysis paralysis, though, either. Uh, there is a such thing of like overrunning the numbers because by the time you find out it's a great property, I already took it because it's gone. I, I, <laughs> it's gone because that's just who I am. I'm like, uh, it looks like it'll work. I'll take it. Like, so. So I, you know, I would challenge you to, um, you know, and this is just personally, maybe join a mastermind out there or find individuals that have the same goal or vision that you do and maybe tag along, you know, yeah. figure out if your goal is net worth or if it's cash flow or if it's tax incentives, I don't know, like figure, find it, find your tribe. And that's crucial because everyone that's listening uh, and, and, and in my rat race members and all that, I always tell them like, it is crucial for you to find your tribe to get to start investing uh, and to totally. continue because it's so hard. It's already hard, period. It's hard to do it on your own. None of my friends were investing in real estate. I can't imagine you have a hundred friends that are investing in real estate. I know Diego doesn't either. Um, so, so it's important to find that community around you that's actively investing. Um, and then, like you said, meet with them weekly or bi-weekly and, 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 and figure out what it is that you want and then who's buying that. So for example, in Rat Race, our, our mastermind, we have like short-term rental tribes and, and wholesaling tribes and realtor tribes. And we have tribes within the community we've built. And all of them are like, they kind of, I don't want to say that they kind of like huddle together, but like the STR tribe meets once a week plus rat race and, and they're doing their thing. And the wholesalers are right. over here and they're friends. And we all meet up together three or four times a year. But like at the same time, it's like they have their own little tribe of like, dude, I'm looking for like 
you know, uh, cash flow to the max, you know, they're, they're, they're willing to risk it all on one deal and they're like super wild. And then you have the wholesalers and they're sharks, man. They're picking up phones. They're looking up deals. They're just making money. Uh, and then you got your realtors, right? Real clean cut guys like Diego's got beautiful hair. You know, he's out there helping people buy <laughs> Trim houses. beard. Oh, right? super yeah. dope. So, so it's really, I like important. that. Yeah. That's great advice. Um, I actually met, uh, one person on Instagram and we had a call the other night about finding a, a short-term rental property here in Florida. So yeah. uh, I, I think, I, I think what you just said though, about having weekly or bi-weekly calls is important. Just stay on task, keep the ball moving because you know what, if you're not, if you're not doing it, it's, it's never going to happen. Yeah. hundred percent. And, and I feel too, like it creates that form of accountability and also your level of conversations, right? Where the standard yeah. Becomes like, hey, I mean, I may not have any short term rentals right now, but I'm joining this group where the standard is to buy short term rentals. So if yeah. I'm going to be hanging out with them, I better buy one in the next six months, a year, couple of months, whatever, uh, because right. they're going to be holding you to that standard. Totally. Really yeah. yeah. Ian, after this call, remind me, uh, or after the podcast, remind me, I'm going to send you a free one month access to Diana. Uh, she's a leader in our community in Rat Race. She runs the short-term rental uh, micro tribe. So send me a DM after this podcast. I'm going to okay. give you one month, one month free to the short-term rental micro tribe. Wow. I think it'll really help you out just so that you can start kind of like learning what it's like to be in a tribe and be around those conversations. You'd be surprised how much growth there is. Would love to. It's all yeah. about who you spend your time with. My parents 100%. always told me that growing up, uh, surround yourself with good people. Yeah. There's a ton of truth behind that. If you surround yourself with people that just want to sit on the couch and watch Netflix, like that's who you're going to become. Yeah, 100% agree with that. Well, Ian, I think that's awesome. Super, super. I'd love to hear, love your story, man. Love what you're doing. I can't wait to see you pay off the 60 grand uh, and buy your first short term rental or, you know, and then just and next see your year. family grow you up. Buy next, next year, 2022. Ian, Ian, hold me accountable, hold accountable, guys. Bro. We got Please this. Do. You're, you're doing it. I'm going to give Please you, like I said, one month free access to the Thank micro you. tribe with Diana so that awesome. you guys can kind of get the ball rolling. Uh, Diego, any last questions for Ian? Any last questions? Well, where can people find you? What is your IG? IG Ian builds well, also on Twitter. Shoot me a DM. Uh, yeah, I got some goodies in my bio if you want to check them out. But uh, if you want to talk real estate or debt payoff or anything, uh, I'm, I'm an open book. So reach out on Instagram at Ian builds well. That's cool. awesome. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for your time. Ian, thank, you, thank you so much. Thanks, buddy. See ya. See you guys. The Rap Race to Buy podcast, where we discuss money, mindset, real estate investing, and ways to achieve financial independence. Whether you are a rookie or a veteran needing new ideas for investing or creating side hustles, you're in the right place.